Well, hindsight may well be a perfect science, but 10 years ago, a uh, 500,000 rand investment in, or 10,000 rand investment rather, in five shares is today worth in excess of six and a half million rand. In the, his cover story this week, uh, Bruce Whitfield went back in time to discover which were the best performers over the last decade and then asked some experts to gaze into that crystal ball to identify what could be the next winners over the next decade. So joining me uh, for this discussion, uh, discussion, as I was saying, Mark Ashton, Finweek editor, Bruce Whitfield, Adrian Saville, CIO of Canon Asset Managers and Wayne McCurry, Head of Momentum Wealth Portfolio Management. Uh, thanks for joining us, gentlemen. And of course, I'm outnumbered here on Women's <laughs> Day. Uh, so, so Mark, you know, the past doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, tell you what's going to happen in the future, but it is fun to see how much money you could have made if you picked the right horses. For sure. I think this whole story basically started as a bit of an ego thing. So Bruce asked me, what share in the last decade has done 25,000%? And of course, he didn't think I'd actually know the answer to it. But <laughs> I got it right, and Bruce had to then go and decide he was going to write a cover story on this. And I think, you know, we, in, in your intro, you looked at it and you said, 50,000 Rand investment today was 6.7 million Rand. And uh, for me, that would be the reason I would want to get into the stock market, this idea that there is some way to be able to generate some real wealth over a decade. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, ten, 10 Grand investment is doable for any man in the street. <coughs> 10 years, believable time frame. I, I think that that's cool. There's just something really invigorating and interesting. And, and I think that that kind of is the allure of the stock market in general, is that you do have opportunities like this. They do present themselves. It's just a case of looking through the, you know, seeing what options are out there. Okay, so we have to explain which were the winning stocks. Uh, well, tell us about that, Bruce. We most certainly do. And what's so interesting about these, other than Mr. Know-it-all over here, <laughs> who happens to think he knows the answer to everything, <laughs> uh, when I said to him, so which was the best performing stock over the last 10 years, he'd been tipped off that it was Pinnacle Technologies. 10 years ago, you would never have dreamed of investing proper money into a company worth 15 million rand on the JSE with an office somewhere in Pretoria. Are you completely nuts? Mm -hmm. But that's what's so interesting about this. And Adrian Savile, of course, um, is a big uh, is a big fan of the small companies. And he'll explain why in just a second. But Pinnacle Technology, PSG. PSG was run by this guy who'd been fired by his own stock brokerage just a couple of years before this. Yanni Mouton. Plus, we've got a small banks crisis who, which we just come out of. Remember You're that. You're going to back someone who doesn't have a great track record yeah. of course course you have to buy into his whole vision. Absolutely, and that's quite high risk. So mm -hmm. would you really back Yanni Mouton 10 years ago? Well, clever people did. Uh, Capitec, that was coming out of the, the PSG stable as well. Howden Africa, what's that? African Media Entertainment, please. It owns Radio Algoa and OFM in the Free State. Are you completely bonkers? But maybe that's the secret to really superlative stock picking, is not looking at the now, but looking at what the potential is into the future. And that's why people like Adrian Saville, Dr. Adrian Saville, um, <laughs> who um, look at valuations of small companies and say, hold on a second, is there the next Microsoft hidden somewhere amongst this mess of small companies that look messy today but could be gems in the future? But how do you know, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Saville, <laughs> as Bruce likes to refer to you as, how do you know that you're not going to uh, Pay a bet on a stock that, of course, is a small cap and could go bust. Yeah, Samantha, I think that that's the key is, you know, how do you know? Um, there's always going to be something hidden around a corner, especially where you're working with smaller businesses well off the radar. And to my mind, that's why it is pivotal that you have a portfolio here rather than a single name. And mm -hmm. the portfolio affords you the opportunity to get some things wrong you will get some things wrong. And if you're venturing out to say, I'm going to get absolutely nothing wrong here, I think that's uh, probably dangerous turf. That's mm -hmm. a fool's errand. Yeah, I mean, just looking back at the environment, you talked about the environment 10 years ago. It was uh, post the tech bubble, 9-11 had mm -hmm. happened, uh, start of the credit bubble, and of course the recession was something people weren't, of course, predicting. Uh, so how, how does that operating environment shape the investment decisions, or does it? Should it? But Wayne's also better positioned than me to talk about this, because mm -hmm. here you've got a position, 2003, it's before Alan Greenspan, well, Alan Greenspan was beginning to get completely crazy with low interest rates. It was before the huge credit boom that we saw around the world that was in its early stages now if you can read the tea leaves properly then you can accurately forecast who's going to do well into the future but if in if you take your mind back to 2003 where the world was a much scarier place than it was today this person bin Laden that America was hunting in the Middle East um, the, the, the gold price wasn't doing particularly much the oil price wasn't doing particularly much um, at that point and suddenly the world over the subsequent 10 years changed I don't know if it's possible to be able to forecast no, today <coughs> what is going to be great in 10 years' time because 
There are so many uncertainties. We have no idea what lies around the corner. No, the, you, you can't, Bruce. I mean, you, you are right. You can't actually forecast what's going to happen in 10 years' time. But you can say a couple of things with reasonable degree of certainty. Mm. Is that capitalism will probably still be here? Okay. Probably. One, one, yeah. Okay. okay. Companies that have been around for 30 years will probably still be around in 10 years' time because they've faced all the challenges, they've done all the things, they've gone through the ups and the downs. So that's probably a reasonable so statement to make. You're picking companies that have a long-term track I'm taking board. big companies, yeah. Small companies, I mean, there are some total gems there. But, you know, if you take, if you take any rolling 10-year period on small caps, your attrition rate is massive. It doesn't mean the companies go bankrupt, but let's just say underperform by 50% or underperform cash. So there are some gems, but that is small caps. You know, small caps, if two out of your 10 or one out of your 10 works, it normally works so well that it makes up for the other nine that don't work. But it takes a, it takes a, a, a different kind of investor to sit through that because sometimes it's painful. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing, Wayne, that we, we, we've got a very concentrated, very small, very liquid small cap sector. I mean, one thing is, you know, RMB came out with their small cap, mid cap ETF yes. last year. I mean, a really cool product. It's something that we don't have. Yes, we've got a couple of unit trusts that kind of trade in that space. Mm -hmm. We've got some nice value managers who, who do kind of see through the cycle. But for retail investors, it's a very nice accessible point. And I oh, think that if you look, so, yeah. if you kind of back test a product like that, you can see that there is value in kind of buying into is. a low cost. But you know, as, as Adrian said, you've got to build a portfolio. Okay. You know, don't hear what someone said on TV or what someone told you in a school car park that this or share is a winner. Or what somebody or what wrote, wrote in Finn <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. say this and just take one. Don't right. ever do that because okay. you might be right. Let me test you on this one quickly if I may. Do you mind? Mm -hmm. if I Go ahead. Would you, would you add anything to your portfolio, any one of these? Santova, Conduit Capital, Zeda Investments, Pan African Resources, or One Logics. Those are Adrian Savile's picks. Yeah, I know that, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we Zeda, Zeda's fine, Pan Af is fine. Okay. I've got no problem with The others, quite frankly, I don't know enough about because mm. I don't analyze small caps really. Okay. So but your top picks, let's, see, let's get into yeah. those and then Adrian can explain the rationale behind uh, the smaller ca companies he's backing. Tell us about those. Sm it's very, very standard, built around essentially one, maybe two themes. The one theme clearly is China is the only economy in the world that has the ability to grow. The rest of the world's economies are overladen with debt and will show sub-normal, sub-par growth for the next 10 years. That's, of course, if you're looking at the developed world. Yeah, what about I other mean, emerging markets? Of other course emerging not markets, where's the capitalization? Where's the history? What do you know? It's very, very risky eh, to go into other into other. Uh, capitalization market so sticking to SA shares mm -hmm. and I mean China will always be the, be the big engine of developed of developing market growth going for Richmond quite clear China theme going for Billiton quite clear China theme Sasol a little bit different I like the gas story in North America I think this will be the world's source of, of energy in 10 years time and Sasol's ideally placed for that Vodacom you know despite MTN's results I still think the this, the cell phone market in South Africa has got the ability to generate extremely good dividends, very, very stable business, sticking, sticking with, with that. And then uh, the last one sitting with Bidvest. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I don't suppose anyone can add much more to Bidvest. Why not? I mean, just, oh, you know, just looking at these stocks, Adrian, do you think that they have the ability to shoot the lights out in the same way that perhaps some of the stocks you've chosen have? Um, the stocks that I've chosen probably have uh, the opportunity to, to dig through the floorboard as much as they have the prospect of shooting the lights out. Wayne uh, has proposed here, I think, some really sensible investments, and there's a lot uh, of, of what he ventures that I like. Vodacom, for instance, for its data. Uh, this is a gold mine. Um, uh, Sassel, I agree absolutely you know, with, the, with the energy prospect. But these are not going to do 100 times or 200 times your money. And I don't think that that's what uh, you know, Wayne is venturing or volunteering. These are great businesses, well-run, good balance sheets. They've got powerful drivers behind them. They'll do well mm -hmm. uh, as an aggregate. What I volunteered is something entirely different. What I volunteered um, are companies that have the prospect to really alter uh, the landscape within which they, they operate. So Santova, tell us about that one. <laughs> It's not a name we talk about a lot. <laughs> no, you know, Santova is going to be off almost every South African investor's radar. Uh, it has to be just by virtue of its size. This is a 150 million rand market cap. Um, 
I think run by a respected, regarded uh, executive team headed by Glenn Gerber. The uh, net current assets of the company make up half of its market cap. Uh, it's been profitable every year since it was listed, which is 10 years ago. And it operates in the trade logistics area, which if the world economy is going to move ahead, admittedly with some difficulty, trade and clearing and logistics are going to do this at some multiple of that. Um, so I really like this uh, from, from that structural perspective. What do you look at when you look at one of these companies? I mean, yeah, okay, we've got Cento over there. You've touched mm -hmm. on management. Um, you know, do you look at what uh, management ownership in terms of the business? Are they regularly buying shares, debt versus cash? Um, and how do you actually assess something like that? I mean, it, it's you, you can get an idea of a strategy for a company like Sasol because they give you an annual report, year big, and they'll tell you what their plans are for the next ten years. But looking at a smaller business like that, I mean, you, you're putting a lot of trust in a relatively small group of people. And, and the levers are, are, are very, you know, it, it, it becomes a highly leveraged business in terms of um, a, a deal comes off, then it, it materially changes the business. Yeah, I think all of those are vulnerabilities. Mm. Uh, they face very high management risk. Mm. They are generally narrow businesses rather than broad businesses, and that leaves them vulnerable to getting just one thing wrong, and the entire business could disappear, as Wayne points out. Mm. Uh, this is why the attrition rate is so high. For that reason, I think you have to do a lot of work on understanding not just the business, but the caliber of the management, the strength of the balance sheet, the, uh, the nature of the industry that it operates in. And whilst they are more vulnerable, I think they also are easier to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, these are businesses that are much easier to figure out. Mm -hmm. It's not 47 divisions. It's not, it's not five 47 geographies. 47 pages of you know, re annual results that you have to delve yeah. through yeah. and pick you know, These the are numbers. neat businesses. You, I, I can explain these to me. <laughs> to Bruce. Bruce. Exactly. Bruce he, can explain, <laughs> he can explain them to me. I, mean, I venture to suggest, Samus, that if you went to pages 16 and 17 of this week's Fin Week and you took a proportion of your money and you put a percentage into each one of the shares that Wayne has chosen and what Adrian has chosen, you've got stability in what Wayne is offering over the next 10 years and a little bit of excitement and adventure in mm -hmm. what Adrian is offering over the next 10 years. And the proportion of your risk that you prepared to put into Adrian's shares determines whether or not you double your money over the next 10 years or whether you do considerably better than that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the risk and excitement sits in what Adrian is, is talking about, what Wayne is talking about is good stability and good, and good solid, solid returns. Yeah. The thing is, I mean, just looking at, for example, you mentioned ShopRite versus Pick and Pay in the article. I mean, ShopRite's returns over this period was 3,215% versus Pick and Pay 458%. What if one of the stocks that are kind of the well-known stocks within uh, the David Shapiro's picks in the article, Wayne McCurry, your picks, uh, what if those are the, the pick and pays. You know uh, what I mean? Oh, it could easily be. Yeah. Easily. Mm -hmm. But again, you, you haven't lost money on pick and pay. You still made a return of what was it, 350? Almost 400, almost, almost 500 percent. Which is not fantastic, but you've not lost money. Mm -hmm. In every portfolio, every unit trust manager, every single asset manager, every single individual who's ever gone and constructed a portfolio of shares, you have some that do well and some that do less well. When you would have bought in this fictitious portfolio pick and pay 10, 10 years ago, Shaul Summers was running the place, Raymond Ackerman, the legend of retail, was was still very much there and driving the business. Why would you support a lunatic like Whitey Besson who wants to go into emerging markets? I mean, you have to mm. be particularly courageous to choose ShopRite 10 years ago over pick and pay. But isn't that the moral of the story? That true, real investment returns require courage. some mm. courage. And courage of being able to say, I believe this is the way in which the world is going to evolve into the future. I'm going to support ShopRite over pick and pay. If you had that foresight, you did better than the person who was more conservative and went for pick and pay over ShopRite. You didn't lose money on pick and pay. It's not a disaster, but boy, you regret not buying ShopRite. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's the point of this article is fortitude, courage, and foresight are mm -hmm. probably very strong characteristics in making outperforming the average on a, mar on yeah. on a market. But, you know, when you're you, taking you, more risk on yeah. it, yeah. Of course you are. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I thought I actually, surprisingly enough, thought long and hard and did a bit of work as to which shares I selected for I you did, there, thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, that's a pleasure. <laughs> and I mean, other ones, that, other ones that I thought of, I think the platinum shares in a 10 year mm. basis are, are very good investments, but it's too risky. You, you might be wrong, mm. you know. Why not choose a company like Rainbow? It's changing its spot, so to speak. It's, it's, it's evolving, it's going into Food Corp. What about Grimnod? 
Yeah. You know, there are still other shares to choose, but you just don't know. And, you know, maybe, maybe the ins let's call us the institutional managers, Shapiro, myself, maybe institutional managers almost haven't got that mindset because, you know, if we are to take a client's pension fund, and even if we invest 1% of the pension fund in the company, that just disappears. Yeah. You know, you, you, are in, you, you quite frankly are in deep trouble. Even if you picked another five that were very successful, you actually can't, you almost conditioned not to take that type of risk on it. And that's why mm -hmm. the large institutional managers choose all the bulletins and the BATs and the Rembrandts and the SABs. You can still do well, you can still beat inflation, but you're never going to pick the winner. I mean, what about, uh, sorry, just, to, go, just go. to pick up on the platinum side of things, I mean, Stuart Cantor picked up on uh, one of the platinum stocks, Amplat is one of his top picks for the next decade. How do you feel about that, uh, Adrian, as a value investor, kind of looking in that deep value space? If I could stay away from Amplat just for a moment, I'm happy to come back to it, but the observation I'd make about you know, Bruce's results is there are two attributes of these superstar investments. The first is they were unloved, at the time that they went into his uh, portfolio 10 years ago this was a banking crisis uh, a, a, a cavalier chap sets out a financial services business um, a, a 15 million rand market cap technology company every single one of them is unloved at the time that they go into the portfolio second they are small um, it's impossible to grow the world's food supply in a pot plant uh, you're going to need to start uh, looking at smaller prospects if you want to achieve uh, super results, notwithstanding Wayne's observations mm -hmm. um, and, and the importance of doing your homework. It's not just about, well, I'm going to close my eyes and buy small unloved stuff. You have to do your homework here. Um, and if the platinum sector, to come back to your questions, uh, Sam, if the platinum sector is unloved right now, I'm interested. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, now Pan African Resources is, is an interesting one because you sent this through a couple of days before the you chief executive You must point that quit. out. I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, does it change? Yeah. However, the chief executive quit. Suddenly, Jan Nelson is no longer there. Does that then, if you, if in, in, with the benefit of hindsight, do you remove Pan African Resources? Because suddenly that element of certainty upon which you base this pick um, is no mm. longer there. Yeah, so when the facts change, I think you have to be willing to change your mind, what's important to change your mind. The management team uh, at Pan Africa is much more than just okay. the CEO, and they have an aggregate experience in operating all of the assets, including in particular Evander. So which, which underlines the point, sorry, so yeah. which underlines the point, of course, of understanding the business and knowing that if one person does go, it's not a disaster. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, there we go. Point I was trying to make. Sorry. <laughs> Back on my box. What are you going to say? I was going to say, we haven't put Bruce on the spot yet to find another 25,000 percent. Uh, yeah, we, we need Bruce's five shares yeah. so yeah. we can reevaluate him in 10 years' time. See, the marvellous thing is I have a lunch appointment <laughs> and I have to go. Uh, okay. um, but but, but here, we, here we sit, Adrian, with, with these five shares. This is called passing the buck. Um, which one of your five shares of Santova, Conduit, Zeda, Pan African, and OneLogix, which is the next pinnacle technology? <laughs> Uh, the pinnacle technology I would venture is either uh, One Logix uh, or Conduit Capital. You've got to choose one. <laughs> <laughs> You're still not going to let me have a no. portfolio, not even of two? No, just one stock. One Conduit Capital. Okay, and from you, Wayne? One stock for the next decade. Out of my five, I think yeah. I'll pick Cesson, in fact. There we go. We'll leave it at that. Excellent. Thank you for coming Because I'm a journalist and I've got to be objective. I couldn't possibly. And you've got to get to lunch. And I've got to get to so lunch. So we'll leave it at that. Take a quick have break. A favorite. No, well. Before we go to break, one stock. One stock. Just I for fun. I couldn't possibly. Okay, <laughs> fine. Well, that's.